Good afternoon. Welcome to the final lecture in session four of the first IHF Live Online Symposium. My name is Courtney Gayen. I am a member of the IHF Media Group and I am the moderator for this afternoon's session. To begin, I'll outline the translation options we have available. This lecture is presented in French, uh, sorry, English. So we have French, Spanish, Arabic, and Russian translation available. This is available only if you are joining us on Zoom. You can find these options at the bottom of your screen by clicking the globe icon and choosing the label for your language. Please note that for Arabic, you need to choose the label Chinese. And also please remember to mute the original audio so that it doesn't interfere with the translation if you're using this function. For those of you joining us for the first time, this first IHF Live Online Symposium forms part of Virtual Academy, recently introduced by the IHF to facilitate global online learning and ultimately licensing opportunities. All of this falls under the umbrella of the IHF Education Center, available at ihfeducation.ihf.info. This afternoon's lecture is presented by IHF lecturer and official Claire Morton Sodal. We are going to stop a few times during this lecture, so please feel free to ask questions throughout. And also note that this is being recorded and you will be able to access it for on-demand viewing later. So Pierre, we're ready to begin. Thanks, Courtney. From my side, from uh, Oslo, Norway, a uh, really warm welcome to this uh, lecture about uh, offensive fouls, which is uh, kind of a joint, uh, it's a joint line where uh, of both the PRC, also the Referee Commission, and the CCM, the Coaching Commission, are the same. So we have the same, same criteria for what is an offensive foul, which is really important because we can't have a situation where we have different interpretations of what's an offensive foul. Uh, during the lecture, um, I will show a lot of clips. Uh, the clips, they are chosen randomly. Uh, they are only selected for educational purposes, so uh, which players that, uh, that are, uh, are involved, which teams or the referees, it doesn't matter, it has zero importance. It's the educational bit from the clips that's, that is important here. Just, uh, I have a general timeline here. Uh, first, we will start with a bit of basics. Uh, what's written in the, what's written in the rules about this? This will be very short. Then we will show. Then I will show some normal situations where, yeah, the most common uh, topic about offensive fouls is the ba the battle for space. Then I will go a bit further and also speak a bit and show a bit how the referees can use the uh, offensive fouls as a really important part of their game management. So for the totality of the game, this will co also con uh, contain balance that more or, less, more or less same action, always the same reaction. Then some situations close to the goal area, uh, which is quite, this is really difficult for the referees also, we must understand this, I will say, I will hopefully say it a lot of times also during the, uh, the presentation, that situations that happens close to the goal area, situations that happen with, uh, happens with uh, a high amount of speed, it's difficult for the referees, this is not easy. Uh, we'll also show some two against one situations then wider in the court, uh, close, uh, closer to the wings, the side back and the wing positions. Then just to reinforce the excellent lecture of yesterday from uh, Mr. Gallego, the chairman of the PRC and Mr. Spete, the chairman of the CCM, about provocations and overreactions. And in, in the end, I will show some special situations. So then we start with the first one, which is the, in the rules, it's written that uh, if we go into the rules and read the rule eight, that's what's allowed and what's not allowed. Uh, longer out in the rule, when we start with rule eight, three, we'll, we will come to the different punishments, but that's not, that's not the topic for today. Here, it's, uh, here in Hamble, it's allowed to use bent arms to monitor and follow the opponent. This is not bent arms. 
This is not bent arms, but here, inside here. So you can really monitor and follow the opponent. It's also you allowed to use the body to block the opponent. Of course, in, uh, this happens a lot around the pivot player, but it, it's all, it also happens when you are really blocked, uh, trying to block the space for an opponent trying to break through, which is also a normal situation where we can discuss about offensive fouls. But what's not allowed? You are not allowed, like, a, like I showed, to use the arms, hands, or legs. In a way, you are not allowed really to extend your body. You are not allowed to use it in a way that gets the attacker um, out of position, just by pushing him away, for example. And of course, elbows are not... Uh, that might be really, really dangerous. And of course, it's not allowed to run into or jump into an opponent. That's, that's kind of the basic rules that involves uh, offensive fouls. How to, how to find the right decision here? It's, it's, it's not always so easy, but for, the, but, but for the referees, freeze the picture. What happens at impact? Who has the space first and who moves into who? And about the last part here, it's never an offensive foul when an, a defender, which is here, runs into the attacker or they run to it, into each other. Then it's never offensive foul unless, of course, the attacker comes in with his knee or an elbow or the elbow or something, of course, but that's special cases. So normal, it's never an offensive foul when the defender moves forward towards the attacker. Neither is an offensive foul when the defender uses the goal area to get into the correct position. That means I might be in the correct position at impact, but before the impact to get into this correct position, I've taken the shortcut, for example, and been running through the goal area or being running behind the pivot player using the goal area to get on the right side. This is also never offensive foul. So maybe a kind of a key for referees to decide what's an offensive foul or not, if we take away the goal area, is to ask yourself, is the, uh, is the attacker uh, able to break through like this and it becomes a sandwich between two defenders? Or are the defenders able to close the space like this? Here, he's not able to break through. So kind of, kind of an effect of the situation. Then, how to see this? Of course, as referees, we must have a position that makes us able to see what happens between the players. And sometimes also, especially later in the lecture, also what does not happen if we have provocations and all reactions and so on. But you must have an angle so you're able to see what happens between the players. That means that means you, you also must feel if the, the not, if the dynamics in the situation reflects the effect. If it's a very, very small contact and it causes a massive fall down, then we are probably for a pro an overreaction or a provocation. And then about the contact, ask yourself, had you been whistling offensive, uh, no free throw, if it had been the contact for, uh, from the defender towards the attacker, if the same contact have been made from the defender towards the attacker? Would, have been, would I have been whistling free throw then? It's maybe an, also something to think about as referees. And then be in position. Some, it's very much easier to make a good decision 
when you are more or less standing still than if you are really running to get a proper angle to be able to judge what happens in the situation. So be in front of the situation, be in position. You will make a lot more correct decisions if you are in a good position before the impact than if you are uh, running to get into the, this position when the impact happens. That's really important. So, uh, I, I, I know that some places the video quality will not be the best. It will be some lagging. Some, uh, in some of the uh, video examples, I will show uh, it will be replays. Some places I will show it two times also. And then afterwards, you will have a slide with some analysis of the situation, very short, and a conclusion. And I will, I will also speak about it. So here's the first one from Kumamoto, this uh, December Women's World Championship semi-final, no sorry, bronze final between uh, Russia and Norway. Trying really hard to isolate her, had a good spell of doing that in the first half, but she's beginning to find a little bit of space now, but that's an attack. Here the referees whistle uh, offensive foul. They want a passive play call. Will come a replay, first you see some struggle around uh, the pivot. That's not the uh, important thing. We'll have the impact, we'll come here. And here you see clearly that the Russian defender, number 13, number two in defense, is running into the Norwegian number 10. This can never be an offensive foul. Because here clearly defender is moving towards the attacker. That makes the contact. She also comes from the blind side, so really the, the attacker has no possibility even to see her. Here it's just play on, wait for the next situation, and then the situation solve itself. So this is a very clear example for what that's not an offensive foul. Next one, this is from the Men's World Championship in Germany. Here it will be a breakthrough situation now with uh, the number one defender trying to close the space. Is he really closing the space? Let's see. Yes, he's first in position. He's outside the goal area. He doesn't use the goal area. He's touching it a bit with his left heel, but that's not enough. This is also uh, very good defending. Arms into his body, clear offensive foul. Defender gets into correct position. He doesn't use the goal area and the attacker is running straight into him. Very clear offensive foul. Bit more, uh, bit more tricky now, but still, Takir tries to go for a breakthrough. Does not succeed. Or maybe she does succeed because uh, the defenders clearly doesn't close. They don't close the space. She's able to break through in a way. For sure, the defenders, uh, the defenders, and especially then the number ten, the number three defender, hasn't has no space first. The attacker has uh, a gap to break through in, and she closes the space by coming into her from the side. So this is also not an offensive foul. This is a normal free throw because uh, the foul happens before the attacker has um, a clear chance of scoring. So this is a free throw for the attacking team. Towards the end of the games, if you see the clock here, it's 24-24, 16 seconds left of a game in the Euro for men this year. Uh, 
so important to get this these decisions right of course like every decision but this is really critical moment let's see what happens And then, of course, the, def the defending team takes a team timeout. They are allowed to do that because it's a goalkeeper throw. So it once more. Look at the defender. Not inside. He's able to close the space. Here the, the referees show uh, nothing, they just wash the situation by doing like this. Here it's much better to take a decision to show that you are sure about this very important situation. And it's of course an offensive foul because the defender is in, has the, the space first, he closes the gap. The attacker runs into him. The defender doesn't approach the attacker. The defender is outside the goal area. And here, really take the decision. Not only wash it out, because that's here it's, people will get an impression that you are not sure about the decision. Of course, it's a big decision, but sell it as an offensive foul, really. Also by using body language and show with your entire body, with your whistle, with your arms, that you are sure about this. Next one, we move back to Japan. Now we will be on the wing. The left wing. That's nice into the wing of crashed into her. She was almost trying to get that penalty. Defender stood still and got taken out. Once more. Attacker has the space first. Nice. Defender the extends off. her body uh, by having a long step with her legs and collides with the attacker from the side. Defender stood still and got taken she's not out. in front of her. Okay, she's outside uh, or at impact, she's outside the goal area. Okay. But she comes in from the side, extends her body. This is a clear seven meter throw. And it's a two minute suspension also. But here the, te the technical decision is what's important in this lecture. This is a clear seven meter. It cannot be offensive foul. Here, the attacker has the space clearly before the defender. And we move back to the Euro. This one is a bit tricky because here the speed is very, very high. Two minutes for the defender. Looks on rather philosophically. Well, it's a tight call. We see it once more. Now Magalais is on and save for Ferlin. Defender in front, stands still. He does not approach the attacker. Even if the speed is very high, the intensity is very high here. This is difficult decision for the referees. Really diff uh, difficult uh, decision. But here, defender sees the situation and places him in front of the attacker. He looks away from him because he wants to catch the ball, of course. It's a high dynamic, but the defender has the space first and he doesn't move into the attacker. But if he does so, then he creates a potential really dangerous situation. So here the margins are very, very, very slim. If the attacker moves into the no, if the defender moves into the attacker here, we for sure have at least a two-minute suspension. Here it might also be a red card if uh, if it matches the rest of the criteria for a red card. 
criteria that are listed in Rule 8.3. But here, the preferred decision is an offensive foul. Back to Japan. And a normal situation where uh, the side back is trying to break through between the number one and the number two defender. And show it once more. As you can see, the defenders are able to close the space. They have the space first. It's no room to break through in for the attacker. So this is a, this is really uh, offensive foul. Even if it might be some body contact before the real impact, it's not. It's no body contact that's not allowed. It's allowed with some body count contact in handball, which is written in Rule 8.1. So, and if you whistle too many free throws in situations like this, the, the game will get very staccato for, for, for you. The rhythm of the game will kind of, um, uh, kind of dis uh, disappear. You will not create a nice dynamic, a nice flow in the game. So here, really important to whistle the offensive fault. So, to go a bit further, it's a, because uh, being referees in a, in a humble game, it's it's about it's not about only taking decisions. To judge every decision or every situation individually, it's also it's also about to manage the game, to be a leader, and to ensure safe and fair conditions for everyone involved. And an important, in a, and in a, an, an important part of this is also to understand the defenders. Give the defenders credit when they play according to the rules. Because if, if, a, if a defender play according to the rules and you whistle against him and the decisions goes against his team, Maybe he will think that, okay, I tried to play according to the rules, but it doesn't work. So then I really can, and then go with the knives and stones in the next, uh, in the next uh, situations. And then we will have a completely different game and a more dirty game. So if we, are really, uh, if we as referees are really able to give the defenders credit when, when they play according to the rules, of course they should be punished when they not play according to the rules, but when they play according, according to the rules, if we are able to give them credit, they will continue doing and uh, do so because it pays off. They will understand, okay, okay these, these referees, they understand, they understand understand me they give me credit now i really try to understand the rules to respect the rules play according to the rules and then the referees they either they gave the ball to me or they, they don't whistle anything at all okay it's nice then i continue to do so it pays off pays off for me pays off for my, for my team and of course, whistling offensive fouls, well, so then the attacker must also ask himself or herself, uh, uh, maybe I must take more distance. I'm, uh, I'm a bit close to the player. Um, this, will, this will also make it easier for you as referees, it will make it easier for the players also. And this, uh, the sum of all this is that it will create a cleaner and more attractive game. Because we want a clean game, a clean high-speed game is an attractive game. It's, it's, good. it's good for the players, it's good for the coaches, it's good for the spectators, it's good for the media, it's good for uh, the millions of TV viewers watching our beautiful, uh, beautiful sport. Of course, it's good for us as referees also because then we have shown a line that the people, that the players can adapt. Then we are predictable in our decision making. Then they trust us, and then everything gets so much easier for us. 
and to be able to, uh, to get this trust from the players. The balance is really the key. And, and to balance is to, is to show consistency. The line must be the same from the first to the last minute when it comes to topics like offensive calls. Of course, we have the last 30 seconds rule, but the, that, that rule has nothing to do with this. You really need to show this consistency as, uh, as a referee to create this trust. And this line, like I said uh, a minute ago, it makes it so much easier for everyone to really to understand you and to accept you, your decisions. And for, be, for being able to do so, more or less same action, always same reaction. That means if it's an offensive foul on this side, it must be an offensive foul on this side, if the situation is more or less the same. If you go for an offensive foul here and a seven meter throw here for more or less same situations, it will, uh, it will not be balanced. And the team who gets both decisions against them, will, they will not feel that the referees are fair. Then they will not trust you and it will make it so much more difficult in the minutes after to regain their trust. It's much easier to lose trust than to regain it. But to balance is really not to compensate. The difference between balance and compensate is really the following. Like I've said, balance is to uh, give the same decision for more or less the same action. More or less because every, it's no situation that are exactly similar, but they are more or less similar. To compensate is, that, uh, is to replace a mistake with another deliberate mistake. So if you whistle an uh, offensive, uh, offensive foul in this end, which you think that, okay, this should really have been a seven meter, and you get a situation in the other end of the field right after, and you see that this is... This is really a seven meter, but it doesn't fit. I have to whistle the offensive foul. Or opposite, you, you do, you, you deliberate make a mistake, then you are compensating. You should never do that, never. Then it's much easier to, or better, just than to make some contact and say, okay, maybe you have a point that I made a mistake in the previous situation. That creates more trust. That's better for our sport than referees that compensate for their mistake, mistakes. Because it's impossible to be perfect as referees. And so many decisions to take during a game. It's, we are humans. We are as, as the players, as the coaches, as normal or spectators. We are just human beings. We make mistakes. All of us. So some um, videos showing this. He's got to maintain it. Got to create a real opportunity here. Illich has got an opportunity. He takes yeah, the shot. He lands inside, situation. according to the referees. The Korea take it away. Fast break. Oh, foul. oh, and it's attacking foul. Wow. Looked like the defender was inside there, and that was a big collision with Kim. And the crowd are not happy with that at all. The bench team, are on their feet. Uh, attacking the team is not so this happy. replay here. Comes in from the side. No, he wasn't inside when he made contact. Never but be offensive that foul, definitely does not look like an attacking foul to me. The Serbian bench wants bench to get, get a yellow card before the, the game has started. Yeah, can you switch out the, the sound? There is Serbian ball still. All very confused. Should secure the win for Serbia. 
Yeah, like this. Sorry. Here we see right after. Um, more or less same situation, not whistled. I can uh, rewind it so you can see it once more. Here, more or less, or it's not more or less same because this is an offensive foul. This is a way clearer offensive foul than the first one, which we can see here. No open space, uh, no uh, space closed from the defender, comes in from the side, attacker has the ball. And we have the collision. This is no offensive foul. But we are whistled that against the, uh, the blue team here, or the dark blue team. Then we come up here. And here you see the space is really closed. And this decision also goes against the uh, dark blue team. Then they don't feel the balance. So the balance gets broken. And of course, uh, it's in the last minutes of the game. So the moment is also critical. And like I said, the first situation can never be an offensive foul. The defender comes from the side and moves into the attacker. The second situation must be offensive foul, no matter what, because this is an offensive foul, like the clip I showed uh, from Japan, when the attacker tries to break through between two defenders, they are able to close the space. And in this setting, of course, offensive foul is the only decision that creates balance. It's the only decision that shows good game management. And just check this. Yeah, my sound is better here. Here from uh, Kumamoto. Offensive foul against Norway. Five seconds later, offensive foul against, against Germany. Once more. Norwegian attacker tries to break through the German defense. The wing comes in there, runs right straight into a German player. Clear offensive foul. And here we can discuss the, the defender moving forward. Is it enough impact? But for balance, this is a very good decision. Creates balance. You can say that the second one is also an offensive foul. Of course, you can decide also otherwise because it's not 100% clear. The first one is 100% clear. But here, good game management creates balance. Offensive foul. Mm. Not so sure, the spectators either. Let's see. Almost no contact. Actually, the defender grabs the shirt of the attacker and falls backwards. Oh, this guy is not so happy. Then we continue. And here, free throw. And then we lose the balance again. See, defender has space first. He's not clearly inside. If he's clearly inside there, it must be seven meter, not a free throw. So if you can compare the first situation, which happens here, fall is very, very, very light because of the very light contact. You can see in the replay. The real provocation Grab, grabs the shirt. And then we see the next situation. Here. This is more offensive foul than the first one. So for balance, 
This for sure must be offensive foul. So, like I've said, first situation, it's a real provocation, grabs the shirt of, uh, of the uh, attacker and falls down himself. Uh, almost without any contact also. Next situation, much more offensive foul. Attacker goes into a space which the number one defender is able to close. So for all the right reasons, the second situation must be an offensive foul. Last, for, before, uh, last example before we open for uh, some uh, questions. Here also it will be a sequence with uh, several situations, three in total. First one, offensive foul given by the referees. Uh, not really able to close the space there, the defenders. Counter-attack. See the re you see the replay? The defender is not in correct position, comes in from the side with the side of her body. And the third situation, more or less the same as the second one. Defender not first, comes in with the side and the referee's whistle offensive foul. Which we hopefully will see here. Open space for the attacker, defender comes in from the side. So here you can say you can say that the referees have a line for the offensive foul, uh, faults, but it's it's not the right line. Neither of these three situations are an offensive fault. Clear. And then even if the balance bet uh, between situation two and situation three here is uh, it's okay, it's the same decision for more or less the same action. It's not the correct line, but of course it's a balanced line. Okay, Courtney, any questions? Actually, none so far. So if you would like to continue, we can just continue. Okay. I know. Oh, wait, maybe some have just come in. Let me just read. Um, well, uh, okay. Uh, there's just one, if a defender defends inside, I don't think this is totally relevant to this, but I think you can answer quickly. Uh, if a defender defends while inside six meters, then is this a direct seven meter throw with or without punishment? Uh, not necessarily. I will, I will come to this because this is actually, this is actually my, Next uh, topic with situations okay. close to the goal uh, to the goal area. So uh, the person asking this question, he was a bit a, a bit ahead of the time, which is very very good if you are a referee. Always be in front. <laughs> so credit to this person. I will I will try to ask his uh, answer his question now. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So here we come to um, situations that happens close to the goal. Uh, goal area also that means close to the six meter line which neither the attacker or the defender really are allowed to go into uh, situations that happens close to this area really in general in 99 percent of the cases the decision should be made by the goal line referee, the referee who stands beside the goal. To be able to take this decision, you must, this referee must be aware where was the place of impact. Did it happen outside the goal area or clearly inside the goal area? To answer the question who was uh, asked me, if it happens clearly inside the goal area and the referee's 
feel that a clear chance of scoring is taken away from the attacker, then it's seven meter. And if it's just if the foul is just that the defender is inside the goal area, it's not a punishment the first time. But repeated use of the goal area, repeated use of the goal area, is always also progressive punishment. If this really continues. And then I don't speak about uh, situations where the goal are empty or the goals are empty because then the, the, the criteria uh, are a bit different. But if it's clearly inside and, the, uh, and destroys a clear chance of scoring, then we have a seven meter draw. So that means that um, the goal line referee must have, con uh, have control of the place of the impact. And let's say it's outside. Then the goal area uh, referee also must know how the defender or the defenders got to their position. Did they, did they use the goal area? Did they run into the goal area? and then out again before the impact outside the goal area line? And how did they close the space? Did they, did, uh, did they have the space first that they were standing and really the attacker was running into the body uh, of the defender? Or did they come more from the side that they were colliding into the, uh, the attacker? So only the goal area, the goal line referee is, uh, is able to control this because the, um, we, we humans, we are not uh, built with eyes that can see 90 degrees. We cannot, I cannot look straight to the camera and then look to, uh, to, to this side and watch into my kitchen. I can't do this. I don't have eyes for it. So if I'm a, I'm a court referee, I cannot see really if this contact happens inside or outside. If it's close, if, if, the, uh, if the contact is clearly outside, then it's something different. But if it's close to the goal area line, I can't see it. And I, can't, and I also can't, can't see it, how the defenders have moved before getting into this position. That means as goal line referees, you must take your view maybe a bit earlier away from the pivot player when you expect a breakthrough, or even better, have a split vision. So we actually can see what happens before the impact. So, uh, so that means that he, uh, that he or she, the referee, must have the view in the situation before the collision. And if you are before, you really can control, okay, no use of the goal area, uh, no use of the goal area getting there. Impact is outside or for sure, or at least not clearly inside. And the, the defender or the defenders had the space first. Okay, I've seen all this then I, it's so much easier to sell my decision. Then I really feel good about my decision as a referee. And it will also show on the body language. Here I'm sure everybody trusts me, but it, it, uh, you must really have the focus into this situation before the collision. And then we comes to the, come to the bit more uh, tricky part. Was it clearly inside or was it the gray zone? Because if we read rule 6.2.c, the last sentence, the first sentence is that uh, you will get a seven meter throw if uh, a clear chance of scoring is taken away from you. But it's also, and entering the goal area means, or take away a clear chance of scoring by entering the goal area, does not mean just touching the goal area line 
like you can see for on the foot to the left, barely touching the line with his heel. That's not enough according to the rules as the rules are written today. I know that uh, some people, coaches also, maybe thinks that uh, it's not so logical because the criteria for an attacker with the ball, that if you are even touching the line with one centimeter and score a goal, the goal will not stand. It will be a goalkeeper throw because you were stepping on the goal area line. But here it's allowed for the defender to, the, the, to step or be on the goal area line, maybe by 10 centimeters. And still it's an offensive foul. I understand it and I, I can ensure you that the referee commission and the coaching commission works together with the rest of the handball world to see if we can uh, create rules with objective criteria about this. But for the time being, this is the line. This is the line that we must adapt to as referees. And this is the line also the coaches must uh, teach their players. This is also written in the rules. So if we go from the left, touching the line, the next one, then we are a bit outside, a bit inside the line, uh, and we are in a gray zone, and the one to the right is clearly inside, clearly inside the goal area. The one to the right, no question. It's clearly inside. Also show the model here. Two green ones just stepping on the line. Or um, the, one of the examples, the example, the green example to the left, where one foot in uh, outside and one foot um, yeah, on the line. The two red ones here, clearly inside with both yeah, circles, which is a kind of a attempt to draw a foot in PowerPoint. How successful it is, I don't know, but uh, I think it proves the point. The red ones clearly inside, the green ones not enough inside. So the with uh, an attacker running in or running or jumping into the defender in the green ones, it's an offensive foul. In the red ones, it's a seven meter throw if the attacker has a clear chance of scoring. So some trends about this is that we whistle too many seven meters for use of goal area, where the defender is outside the goal area at impact. That means that our eyes are too late into the situation. So we just see the collision and then things go so fast that the situation very quickly gets into the goal area. Because we, are, uh, because we don't have the eyes in the situation before impact, so we can control this, we come at impact or after impact and then just say, uh, see that players are in the goal area. And then we take the automatic decision seven meter, which sometimes is, sometimes is right, sometimes it's wrong. On the other hand, it's also really challenging for us to observe use of the goal area from the defenders before the impact, because we are so we are so focused on the pivot player, or maybe we also cheat a bit as goal line referees and watch the ball. It's not interesting for a goal line referee to watch a ball go from A to B or from one player to another to a third player on 11, 12 meters, then we must control the, uh, the area around the pivot player. And if we are too late and we don't see this use of goal area, which I will sh show in some examples also now, it's, um, it's, simple, it's uh, very difficult to get the right decision. So some, some examples. Here we are back in Kumamoto. A Moscow line player. Here we will have a breakthrough situation. 
Referees whistle seven meters. For Vyakirev. Here we see the replay, the heel of the defender. Impact is up, is on the line. Penalty. She's not clearly inside. Is putting in a huge work rate. So according to the rules, as it's written today, this is an offensive fault. Just the heel on the goal area line is not enough for saying that she's clearly inside, referring to the two models I've shown you some slides ago. All the back line, Siva and uh, Magalaesh in their last defeat. Seven meter. As a penalty is given. Away through Dolanets, tees up. Here it stopped. Okay. Uh, if we see the impact here, defender has space first, and the impact is clearly outside the goal area line. Not clearly inside, but clearly outside. This can never be seven meter for using the goal area. But they end up in the goal area very, very quick afterwards. That means that if the referee doesn't have his eyes in the situation before impact, the seven meter might be the result of it. So this is an offensive foul. The defender has the space first and the contact is clearly outside. He doesn't move towards him. He does more or less everything correct. Here now look on the right wing. Here the referee's whistle, offensive foul. Oh, team timeout, now we will have a, a replay. Here you see defender clearly inside getting to the position. A bit back. Here, he uses the goal area to get into the position where the impact is. From the beginning, she's inside the red area. Clearly, with one foot, moves sideways towards the, att the attacker. Then we can say she has advantage of using the goal area. Here, maybe she's not clearly inside at, at impact, doesn't matter. She has used the goal area to get into this position. Like it's written here on the slide, she moves clearly inside to cut the angle, to make the angle for the wing as little as possible. Even if she's not clearly inside at impact, she has had an advantage of using the goal area. This can never be offensive foul. It must be a seven meter throw for the attacker. Of course, it's seven meter for the attacker. I've never heard about seven meter for the defender. Here there are two situations. Second line play goes in. She's got offensive foul. Wing. Whistle correctly from the referees. Counter attack. Contact outside or inside. Let's see. Seven meter whistled. Just have been defending inside the area against Gudjonsson. There was a quick pass. He's been so active. Here, clearly space first for the attacker and clearly outside contact. We will show again. First situation defender moves sideways. Close. Too little space taken from the. Uh, Attacker towards the defender, therefore the collision, offensive, offensive fault, very good decision. 
This is probably a field referee decision. And this is only a goal line referee decision. And we see here, here is the impact and it's clearly outside, but the speed in the situation is very, very high. Therefore, the players very shortly get inside the goal area. But here, first a decision, good decision for offensive fault. Defender is first in space and the attacker is too close and also moves into him, also using the arm like this. Second situation is also with a defender in correct position and the contact is way, also way clearly outside goal area line. So clear offensive foul in the second situation as in the first situation. And of course, this would also be very nice for balance, like, we, like I spoke about uh, 15 minutes ago. Here we have the chance of having the same decision in a very short period of time. And here, the same decision is also the correct decision, but it's also give us one other credit that it creates balance, it creates trust in the team. Next one comes a bit quick. Uh, we'll have it. Well, you'll have it once more. Let's have a replay. Once more. Here, just show again. This is not easy. Here, it's it's marginal. But only one heel from the defender on the goal area line at impact. This is not clearly inside. Good decision from the referees, offensive foul. She's able to close the space first, the defender, without using the goal area line, uh, without using the goal area. And if she has both feet on the goal area line, she's not clearly inside at impact. So here also, this is an, an offensive fault, according to the rules today. And the instructions and the criteria. This, the last one, is an offensive foul. It's probably one of the most difficult clips I will show in this lecture, uh, this one. Coach maybe also thinks that it's difficult. What happens first? The contact uh, outside or the contact when the defender has the foot clearly inside. And this is so close that here we must understand the referees also, really understand the referees that this is so close that really both decisions is acceptable. But it must reflect the line you have on the game, of course. But here, our interpretation is that the, um, the right foot of the defender is clearly inside at impact, and therefore she, it's a seven meter throw. But here the decisions really could go both ways. But this is this is not a clear clip where we can say this is black or white. But it's also important to show some. Uh, we speak about gray zone, so this is probably a, this is a gray, really a gray zone clip where uh, just to also to show and show how difficult sometimes the work also for the referees is. I think this shows this in a nice way. Come back on at the back, number 18. More common yeah. place for her. What? Penalty Seven meter? Inside the area. Looks like might be offensive foul or maybe not enough contact, so maybe nothing. Here, 
here. Look at how the uh, the, the white defender is using come the goal back, area. Back. From this position, not, not so deep. easy to see. More commonplace for her. But Bounty. from the camera, Depending which is more or, or more in the angle or the viewing angle of the goal and referee, here we see 77 clearly inside the goal area. One foot and moves into the goal or moves in the goal area the entire way to stop the defender. So at first sight from the main camera angle, this looks like our, and which is the same angle as maybe you have, we have from the table uh, uh, or from the bench. It looks like something that can be an offensive foul. But here, luckily the goal line referee has much better position. She has much better focus. The defender is using the goal area to close the gap for the attacker. And the decision is also, is also well sold because she shows by, by using body language, which is, which is very important when the decisions are not 100% clear for everyone to explain by body language why you have taken the decision you have taken. But here, seven meters, it's a very good decision. Now we come to wing. Goal or offensive foul or seven meter would be a bit unlucky to take away an advantage if we think it's a foul of the defender. The defender is in front or let's see. Uh, we'll say a very long step. He extends his body to take away the angle for the uh, attacker. But also to get in the, this position, he turns around for some reason, one foot at the goal area line, one foot clearly inside the goal area. Clearly inside the left foot here. Oh, I'm sorry. I will stop it. And then outside again. Clearly inside and then gray zone, but with an extended body. A long step. So here, this incorrect position means that he's not clearly in, uh, inside that impact. But look, just look at the movement which the goal line referee must see. He moves through the goal area to get into this position. So this can never be an offensive foul. And it can never be an offensive, offensive foul either because of the extension of his um, width between the two feet. He extends his body. So advantage and goal, good decision here. So before we open with some questions again, one more topic, and then it's a two against one situations, which we also saw a clip of really early in the presentation, where um, uh, the attackers are able to create a numer numerical advantage maybe, but then it's contact between uh, often the side back and the number one defender. This, this contact can also happen after ball has been played. So then it's really important as the referees also that the referee responsible for the situation also has his view or her view into the situation after the ball has been played. Because maybe after ball has been played, yeah, it might be an offensive foul or it might be a situation for blue card if the, then the, the defender comes with the elbow and right in the face or something. So we must keep our view in the situation the entire time until the situation is clear. But in the two against one, we must be really sure because here the attackers have been able to create a numerical advantage. 
And then we must also really see what the defender or defenders are doing to defend this. And then question to ask as always, who has space first? Also the who moves into who? Is the defender moving towards the attacker? Those things are really key to make a correct decision here. Can see situation here first. Now it will be on the between number one and number two here on the left side. Once more. Numerical advantage, two against one. But here, defender is first in space. Is clearly outside. And the, uh, and the attacker jumps into him while the wing player is free. So they play themselves to a two against one. Number one defender closes the gap for the side back, who still goes for the breakthrough. The impact is clearly outside the goal area. This is a clear offensive foul. And here, really free throw is the impossible decision. But because if this is a foul from the defender, that means that the attacker has the space first, then it's a clear chance of scoring, then it must be a seven meter. So here it's black or white, it's offensive foul or seven meter, but he, exactly in this situation, it's a seven meter. It's a, sorry, it's an offensive foul. Next. Again. Here we have an advantage, so referees are a bit lucky maybe that the situation solve itself, or maybe, or maybe not. Break to attempt, out to the wing, miss, so on. I will put this down to uh, sequences. Here, the two against one is created. Small push also from the side, from the number two defender. If we see the arms of the number one defender, they are really towards the attacker. So she creates this situation herself. She ends in the goal area. And for a wing player to jump in with a player lay, laying below her in the goal area, that's really not a very good uh, thing. And here also you see he, she hits her afterwards. And now, uh, it goes to advantage, but here, push from defender, push from defender, defender in goal area. And that means when a defender is in the goal area, when it's a clear chance of scoring, even if the attacker here has clear body and ball control at the moment of the shooting, she is disturbed so much that this is a seven meter. This is what we call a standard situation. If the, if the impact is no offensive foul, the defender ends up in the goal area, in the goal area, and the attacker has to jump over her. It's a seven meter if the attacker doesn't score. Of course, if the attacker score, it's a goal advantage. So like it's written here, it's no offensive foul. Defender, the defenders, are responsible for ending up in the goal area and clearly destroys the chance of scoring, which is this interpretation when the, the defender is laying in the goal area and the wing, wing has to jump over her. Next one, which is not, it's a bad video quality, but I think the example is quite clear. Here, look at the number one defender, number 17, two against one, clearly runs into the attacker, can never be offensive foul. If I can show it once more, I can. Here we have the two against one. Of course, it's 
it's easier to create two against one when they also play with one player more. Oh, sorry. Comes around. Peterson. And that was the next one. Now I'm back. Creates two against one. Now, defender into the attacker. Clear, clear, clear. Foul from the defender can never be offensive foul. So here, just play the play the advantage, and the attacking team will have a 100% clear chance of scoring. Next one. Not the same one. Peterson, Goodmundson, that's an attacking foul called against Marason. The playmate. Let's see again. Comes around. Wing defender here Peterson, with the side elbow. Jumping into the uh, attacker. Here it's not the attacker who makes the contact, the it's the defender. The Look here. More. Just turns almost his back. There's no offensive foul. Same concept. Creates two against one. Wing defender jumps into the side of the attacker with high speed. Never offensive foul. And here, advantage. And then it's a direct two minute suspension afterwards if we think that this is uh, this jumping into the defender, not into the attacker from the defender is. It's for a direct two minutes, which I think in this situation. So never offensive foul. Last one before the questions. Courtney, so be ready. Check movement. Two against one. Jumps into a defender. Ends up in the goal area. And the attacker has to jump over the defender. But is it an offensive foul? Yeah, middle player comes and jumps right into the defender. And if we go back, see, defender is outside, defender is outside, defender is clearly outside. He's first in space and he's jumped into. So again, two against one after a check movement, like uh, wing defender tries to close the gap, uh, the space, the attacker jumps into him before playing the ball to the wing. So this is a clear offensive foul also. Courtney, questions? Yes, uh, we do have a couple. Yeah. So uh, a couple of questions about situations occurring in the air inside the goal area. So when the defender is blocking, jumping, or if there's a Kemper situation and a defender interferes, yeah. um, can this can this be ruled against the attacker? What do you think about these situations? The, qu the, qu the, question, the question is if the defender, uh, where, uh, where the defender jumps from, does he jump from outside the goal area or inside the goal area? And does the defender jump into the attacker or does the attacker jump into him? It's more or less the same, it's more or less the same questions. Of course, it's very, very rare that we have offensive fouls. I can't remember seeing one with the, uh, in the air. Uh, in the goal area, for example, with a Kempa, where, uh, where uh, the wing is jumping into the goal uh, goal area, catching the ball, and then co collides with a defender, because then the defender, in most cases, will come from the side, and then it's uh, then it's probably a seven, then it's a seven meter if he doesn't score, if we have a clear chance of scoring, and then probably also punishment. But the key here is where. Does the defender jump from? It's like blocking a shot. Mm -hmm. If you are in the air blocking the shot over the goal area line, that's allowed if you have jumped from outside, but it's not allowed if you have been jumping from inside 
the goal area. Uh, okay, this, there's another one. Um, <clears throat> if the defenders have used inside the six meters to force attacker fouls, um, if this happens more than once, do you start to punish all the players or do you just focus on the one player who has done this the first time? Uh, a, te a team, it's not, it's, not like, uh, well, it's not like one player has one chance uh, we, uh, to use the goal area without getting punishment. The rules is clear that repeated use of the goal area should be progressive punishment. And that, mean, that, that, that means, okay, if player number 13 uh, does this one time, then player number 20 does it one time, then player number 15 does it one time, then player number 17 does it one time, and so, but it depends if it's marginal, yes, yes, the only seven meter, but if it's clear use of the goal area, repeated clear use of the goal area should be punished. Okay, that's all for now, so we can continue. We can continue, then we have approximately 15 minutes left. That's not so, um, that's not so bad timing. Uh, right. Just to reinforce the um, uh, idea that uh, Dietrich Spät and Ramon Gallego gave yesterday about Hollywood or what we say provocations and overreactions. It creates really bad image for our sport and it becomes sadly more and more a hot potato. That is, we have more and more situations like this. We really need to protect the beauty of our sport. Here again, it's, it's more or less to spot this, it's more or less like spotting an offensive foul. The positions of the referees, they are, they are as essential. We must be able to see what is happening, or in some cases also not happening between the players. Here, attacker, defender, what's happening between them? And then we must have an angle, because if you see now, you can't see what's happening between my hands. We must have an angle to see between the players. And of course, if we allow this, it will continue. Then the defenders actually will think, okay, the referees give me credit also when I don't play according the rules. So I can continue with that also. And the attackers think that, okay, they allow, they allow the defenders to do this, then I will also do this when I, when I play defense. So this is a neg really negative circle. So the, this should be pro punished pro with a progressive punishment in most cases, but also in severe cases, because it creates so bad image of our sport, we can re use rule 8.8, which is uh, uh, unsportsmanlike con conduct that warrants a direct Two minutes suspension. Here, this clip was also shown yesterday, but uh, it's a repetition. Here, no, almost no contact at all. The player, she knows it herself. tries to provoke it, but it doesn't make any contact. The uh, attacker is more or less standing still. It's a clear situation, which is so severe that this is nice just to give her two minutes. This is not a good image for our sport. So it's no contact caused by the attacker here. It's just a clear attempt to trick the referees into whistling offensive fault. It's also clear that the punishment should be really strict in this situation. So really important for us as referees to detect this and remove it. And it's of course never an offensive foul. It's a direct two minutes and a free throw for the attacker. Next.
not that clear. And a yellow card. Again, bit of speed game. Attack. Defender goes forward, makes contact with the attacker, and throws himself back. Which we can see here in a way, but not so, uh, repetition is not so good. Yeah. So here, the referees are in a very good position to see that the uh, defender closes the gap to the attacker by moving forward. forward. Then after quite a small contact, he falls. He tries to provoke an offensive fall, fault and also overreacts a bit to the contact. So this is a good decision. Never offensive foul. And a prog here, a progressive punishment. So starting with the yellow card. For the defender, that's a really proper reaction. So this is a really good example uh, for yeah, uh, how re the referees solve a situation, which is a bit tricky in a good way. This is not so nice with, the, uh, with only the finger like this, but the uh, message is very clear. A clear body language over here. It's contact, yeah, but it's an overreaction. Tries to provoke an offensive foul. Yeah, it's con it, it is contact, but it's not enough for offensive foul. It's not enough for her to fall uh, some meters into the goal area. She also provokes the contact a bit herself. This also, clear provocation, never offensive foul, progressive punishment is a proper decision. In the second half or after the yellow card, the yellow cards are gone, it be, then a progressive punishment becomes a two minute suspension. Now look on the left wing of the uh, where the green green team will uh, break through. The defender clearly tries to provoke an offensive foul, and it's also a clear overreaction, and he instead of provoking this offensive foul, is actually running into the attacker and runs into him from the side and running into an opponent like this. Also good for a direct two minute suspension. So here the referee is also, it's very good that of course that they don't whistle the offensive foul, which would have been a really bad decision and a very, very bad decision also for the image of the game. But here also direct two minute suspension this is uh, something we, do, we don't want to have it. And then, in the end, some specials. For uh, referees, really expect the unexpected. Everything can happen. Be prepared. Act, don't react. Be in front of the situations. Don't run behind the situations. Also, and also after the ball has left. Also, the ball has less, left the attacker. When the ball is thrown, also a lot of things can happen. Of course, it's possible to make some tricks that can create more space for the teammates, for example, or you can make some really nasty fouls. But if you make some tricks that, for example, you play the ball and then pull the shirt of the defender close to you to create space, for the teammate you are throwing the ball to, this is also a clear offensive foul. 
some examples. Look here at uh, here uh, Russia plays five against one. Look at uh, defender no five one defense. Look at the defender who's four uh, in front number thirty one. Who's doing what? Who is doing what? Or other question, what does the attacker do wrong in this situation? Nothing. I'll try to stop it. Here. First contact, some arms, then the defender blocks the arm of the attacker. If you see now on the chest of the, defend, uh, of the defender, he is holding the arm of the attacker. And this is a clear offensive foul. No, sorry, sorry, it's not a clear, it's never offensive foul, it's clearly a foul from the defender. Sorry, my for my tongue slip. Defender takes the arm and tries to provoke and create an offensive foul. And here he is able to fool the trick, the referees. So here, never offensive foul. Maybe if it's no big advantage, then stop the game. Clear personality, body language to the defender. Stop this or progressive punishment. Here, just to show how differ different situations can be from different angles. Give it. Collision. What? No offensive foul. We see it once more. Just legal contact from the team, or? But then we see it from another angle. It's the same situation. And here we see a clear, clear, clear push from number 18 that pushes the pivot player of the white team into the other defender. Push from behind, never offensive foul. Direct two minute suspension and free throw for attacker. Because here the push from behind comes before the offensive foul, which comes because of the push. Last example. <laughs> Offensive foul, or what happens after a ball has been played? Oh! Once more. Defender from side jumps into the attacker. Court referee whistle offensive foul, even if it's close to the goal area line. But here in the replay, you see this is a really bad defending. Elbow up in the face. This is never an offensive foul. This is, is actually a red card for the defender. This is endangering the health of the attacker. So this is a clear situation for rule 8.5, which is a direct red card. Okay, Courtney, questions? Okay. So uh, we have a few more questions about it, the, particularly the goal area. Uh, well, someone has asked about, is there ever a situation where it can be an attacker foul if there is a collision between the jumping attacker and the goalkeeper just standing? That's, if that's an attacker foul or also, also the, the goal area belongs to the goalkeeper. 
the goalkeeper is allowed to stand in the goal area. If the goal area, if the uh, if the if the attacker jumps into the goalkeeper who is standing right inside his goal area, goal area, and then afterwards shoots the ball. I never, I never, I never seen kind of situ situations like that where it's whistled, where it's whistled, uh, where it's whistled at the attacker foul. But it's, uh, it's very difficult to imagine a situation like that. But. Uh, also, in, in, in general, for sure, that's not the, foul, uh, the fault of, uh, of the, goal, the goalkeeper, because the, goal, the goalkeeper must be allowed to try to shoot and to save the shot. And if he's not able to uh, be allowed to save the shot, of course, then... But this is, this is a really tricky question to, uh, to answer without having, a, without, yeah. having a, without having a video look at how the situation looks, to be honest. Um, someone asked when, when, in which situation can you give a clear guideline for when it is an attacking foul inside six meters? Yeah, it's the situations are when the when the defender is clearly inside. If the defend if the both feet of the defender or one foot of the defender is clearly inside, like the toe is inside the goal area line, then it's for sure is clearly inside. The, uh, the, uh, the figures I've, or the drawings I've shown earlier here, there we can see that the, uh, so when we have the gray zone where some part of the foot is inside and some part of the foot is not, in, uh, not inside or outside, then it's uh, then then it's a gray zone decision, and then he's not clearly inside. So the criteria is very clear that when uh, for the moment for the rules as the rules and the criteria are now, when a defender has the entire foot inside the goal area line, then he's or uh, or he uh, has the clearly foot on or inside the goal area line, then he is clearly inside. Okay, let's just jump back quickly to the question before because I've just received a clarification that if the per if the attacker shoots the ball and then cla uh, crashes into the goalkeeper, is there ever this situation that the attacker is at fault? No, no, that seems very uh, that that I can't imagine a situation like that. No. Okay. Uh, then the only other one so far is. Um, any advice about the control zones for the referees, how to divide them? Yeah, uh, good question. Because here, especially in the breakthrough situations, it, uh, it means that the uh, goal line referee must take the, his view away from the pivot player uh, early or, or a bit earlier than the actual, actual impact to see what's happening before the impact. So that, that, that means that probably when the court referee knows that here it will be a situation close to the goal area line, which my partner is in control of, maybe he should also then switch a bit to, uh, to look what's happening around the pivot. That might, that might, be, a, that be, might be a useful task dis distribution for situations like this. But, it, but in general, adapt to a task distribution where the goal area, no, the goal line referee controls the goal area. That's my, that's my big, uh, that's my big, uh, that's my big advice. Situations around the goal area line must be controlled by the goal line referee because he has the position to see what happens where the positions are at impact. For the uh, involve uh, the players involved, and also, especially to see what happened before the impact. Okay, that's uh, the end of the questions. So, um, thank you very much, Pierre. We have received some messages that this is a really great presentation, and your explanations are very helpful. So, 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and just to let everyone know what's coming up next week, our final week of the first IHF live online symposium. On Friday, we have IHF lecturer Rafael Giorosa talking about collective defense and building a collective uh, compact defensive system. It's the first lecture on Friday. And then Tono Hewlin, another IHF lecturer, will talk about the last 30 seconds rule um, in relation to the IHF PRC and CCM criteria. On Saturday, we have IHF lecturer and coach Yareen Stiller presenting about seven against six. Uh, with a focus on more than just positioning. And we close at three o'clock on Central European summertime on Saturday with a presentation that I think is also gonna be interesting for a lot of people here because we have some questions and uh, ideas about rules. Ramon and Diedrich, um, Ramon Galejo, chairman of the Plain Rules and Referee Commission and Diedrich Sparta, chairman of the Commission for Coaching and Methods will be talking about future ideas and proposals for game and rule development. So that's coming up next week. Thank you very much again, Pear. We hope we'll see everyone again next week. Bye-bye from my side also. Bye, everyone.